Hey there, I'm Ryan and welcome to today's landscape tutorial. All of the tools and materials will be listed in the video description. And if you'd like help with the drawing process, I will have the traceable up over on Patreon, where you can also get access to the eBooks, bonus lessons, art critiques. There's a lot up there to help aid you in your creative and artistic endeavors. But with that, let's jump into today's tutorial and get creative together. So we'll begin here today in the sky with our flat headed brush. I am going to dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water, then proceed to wipe off the excess. This will just give us a bit of a longer wet life with our paint. And from there, we're actually going to tackle the sky in a really unique way. We're only going to do half at a time. And I'm going to start by grabbing some Mars black, moving that down here on the palette. We'll grab a little bit of our cerulean blue, about half that of the Mars black, and we'll grab a hint of our titanium white just to brighten it up a little bit and let that blue come through. Then I'm going to start applying it in the top left hand corner, as you can see, and work my way towards the right, but also towards the bottom. We'll give it a bit of a bend in our stroke because we want both the center and the bottom to be a bit brighter. So we'll just continue moving this forward. We'll do this part relatively quickly, that way it remains wet. As we move into our next mix, which we'll do now, we'll grab about an equal mixture of cerulean blue to the Mars black that we previously had. We'll grab a little bit of titanium white that will desaturate the blue, but it'll also brighten the mixture. We'll apply that to the bottom bring it towards the fire, which we can paint over. We can always go back and redraw that in. And before I start blending these, I'm going to make sure that it goes all the way to the top. And I'm also going to work around the drawn, almost a visual fissure that works its way through the sky. So we'll just bring this up again. We're doing it somewhat quickly so we can do a wet into wet blend. And now that we have all of it, we'll start that blend. We wanted to wait because we didn't want to dilute our pigment at any point because we didn't want to bring these really dark pigments over into the brighter areas or the really bright areas comparatively into the darker one spot or another. And I'm doing a lot of the blend with an X shaped pattern. This, if you go very softly and very meticulously, can leave you with essentially no brush strokes. But here I actually want a number of them because I want a feeling of movement within the sky. That said, let's get you a little bit closer and let's continue building it up. So from here, we'll grab a bit more cerulean blue, titanium white, We'll just continue brightening this and increasing the saturation minorly. From there, we're going to go to the edges that we've established. We we'll use the sharp edge of our brush to cut along. As you can see, have it work its way down, let that paint dissipate as we get towards the bottom because you want more of that brightness towards the top. And then yet again, we're going to work with an X-shaped pattern to blend this out. Here you can see that this mix is still wet, so I'm getting a fairly smooth blend. But if it's starting to dry, just incorporate a little bit more water on your brush. And if it's fully dried, you can do a wet into dry blend. Which can also look really nice. So here you can see Occasionally I'll apply slightly more pressure on the outskirts and that'll leave blue on the canvas which I can then blend out. But I'm doing so sparingly. Here it's starting to dry so I'm going to get a bit more water on my brush. Come back in. And now I can get those smooth blends again. Just like so. I also want some towards the bottom. Now I'm going to move the camera back yet again because 
I really do want to see this from a bit of a distance as we build up the blues because it's easy when you are close up to just continuously increase the contrast dramatically and it looks great close up but when you step farther back when you see it from essentially the distance you would in a real room it can become overly abundant so we're just going to be a bit careful move that camera back and if you can stand a little bit farther back when you paint that's also beneficial you can do so by holding your brush like this physically stepping back you can also have a mirror on the other side of your room and look in that while you paint it's a little tricky but we're not dealing with any real detail here so if you're going to try it in practice it's not a bad time that said we're going to go in and really brighten portions of this but I don't want to do so until we've started to establish the other side so let's do that so we'll start this side as we did the last with an abundance of our Mars black about half that in cerulean blue and a little bit of titanium white we apply that to the top corner we work our way towards the left and downwards you can see how it's a bit rounded in its descent grab a bit more and if you're wondering why we split the sky into two parts for this it's because we have a natural breaking point in the middle so visually we can get away with it but in addition to that it's good for practicing your color mixing and your matching because if we did all of it at once, while it may look good, you can kind of fall on the right colors, get lucky a little bit, where with this, you have to make that color twice, you have to match it, and therefore it forces you to remember how you did it, so the next time you want to render a similar pigment, you have this in your memory, you have that practice, you've done it more than once, you've proven it to yourself, right? It's just a really good way, in general, of becoming a stronger painter. Not just mixing the color once, but forcing yourself to do it a couple of times. It's also beneficial in that it makes the process a little bit easier, not in a color mixing standpoint, but in a blending standpoint, because we can focus on one area while it starts drying without having to jump back and forth it just makes it not stressful here going in with that brighter blue and we want it on the bottom want it working its way out just like we had on the other side, though it doesn't have to be symmetrical, and I actually advise it not being symmetrical. Now, we have an abundance of paint on here, which means adding more to it can be a little bit difficult, and whatever we have on the palette, we're not actually going to apply there. It's going to be a mixture of what's on the palette and what's on the canvas. So we're going to make our mixture even brighter than it needs to be, because it needs to compensate for the darker mix, which is already on the canvas. So. I'm adding extra titanium white, we're adding extra cerulean blue, we'll take some of that pigment off the brush because we want a controllable amount, and we'll start applying that through here. It doesn't have to be perfect along this edge, it's really more just of a, a guide. We will go back in, redraw it, make it a little nicer. But now that we have it all the way up and down, now we start into our blends. And the more we blend it, the darker it gets, the more akin to the other side. The sky begins to look. Applying a little bit more pressure to get that pigment a bit more noticeable. There we are. 
If it ends up being a bit brighter than the left hand side, that's also okay. Because we're going to add a lot of light to that as well. Just not with this brush. So we have this nice patch, kind of moves into there. It's a bit nebulous in shape. We can also do a little bit over here. We don't have to, but I wanted to do this just to show you that this side is now dry. We're painting wet into dry rather than wet into wet. So it's a little bit more rough and you can hear it. I'll be quiet. Hear that? You can hear the grain a little bit, which isn't a bad thing, but the water on the brush is letting us move it out nicely. And because all of the darker hues and values have dried on this side, these applications are brighter than what they are over there because it's not actively blending with the darker pigment, just optically. Now I'll switch over to our filbert brush because it has a nice rounded edge and that's great for blending, especially with smaller details. I'll make sure that it's nice and damp and then we'll head over to our palette where we'll continue to increase the brightness of our mix. So that does just mean here adding additional titanium white. When we add the titanium white, we might want to add a little bit more cerulean blue to resaturate it. And you can tell that there's a real difference between this hue and this hue. So it's brighter, it's more saturated, and it's a great way of continuing the pigment that we have through here. Now I want to begin right on this side. I'll apply a fair amount. We'll do some over on here. Again, not too worried about the center, we can build that back up. And then once I have a good amount of that pigment worked onto the canvas in areas that I know I want it. You can see that we are skipping some areas, trying to keep it a little bit randomized. I'll take the excess pigment off of my brush, make sure that the brush is yet again damp, and then do nice soft blends, working our way out from those hues. just like this. You can use the sharper top of the brush to incorporate a little bit of line work if you want. Not mandatory, but I did try to have some line work, some motion within our previous application, so I'm going to keep that consistent. You can have it perfectly smooth. I just want it to be a bit more lively. Grab a bit more paint. Start working that out into the brighter areas on the edges. I'll also be more mindful of where my hand is in relation to the camera. I've been doing this for a lot of years, but for whatever reason, whenever I jump into a, the painting, I kind of lose myself for a minute. I mean, it's, you know, I think just the excitement of jumping into a new canvas, but I do forget about my hand placement. So I apologize if at any point it was in the way, and I will very actively consider that as we proceed. You can see that we're building up a lot of depth within the light, a lot of variation within the values, there's a variation within the hues themselves. Not grabbing a lot of extra paint when I do grab more. There we go. And we'll just soften this one a bit.
Now, it's important to remember that the fire is going to move its way up to about here. So a lot of this is going to be distorted by the image of the flame, which means this is really our real estate to embellish and ensure that those details are seen, those highlights are prominent and notable. Here we're doing a bit of a wet into dry blend out in the outskirts, and you can tell with the wet into dry, you can see a bit more of the canvas tooth showing through. So if you look at that blend in relation to that blend, but I actually really like the canvas tooth when we do starry skies, because it just builds all of this extra depth and texture. We're going to make that area a little bit, a little bit darker, or that's darker, or that's darker, or this is darker. You can see that we're building these essentially openings within the light. And we're not expanding it out to a grand degree at any point. It's all just minor additions here and there. We're also trying to bounce around the canvas quite a lot. There we go. And by bouncing around, we ensure that we don't accidentally instill the same markings too frequently in the same area. It doesn't look too repetitive. Again, the bottom doesn't matter as much, but we still want it to be cohesive. It's a little bit darker, and that'll be nice because it'll bring out the highlight in the flame. I think this is a little stark of a transition, so we'll just soften that. So now stepping back, I think it really is starting to come along. It's time to get a bit more bold with our highlights. So we'll grab some titanium white, work that over towards our blue, take the excess off. We don't want too much paint here. We're going to go into really the heart of the blue and we'll blend that out softly using that rounded edge of our brush. And if you're new here, you can get the exact same brush set I'm working with in the video description. There's a brush set that we designed very specifically for this channel and all the lessons on it. So if you go back through the catalog of everything that has been, it's been rendered in the last year or so, it's all been done so with these brushes. So you never have to second guess if your brush is too big or if the bristles are too stiff. If they work as smoothly. But there is a link in the description if you're interested. Here we're working with the Filbert. Great for soft blends especially when you want to do so in a bit more of a condensed area. We'll also take that highlight, make it a little bit more blue, a little bit less titanium white heavy. We'll just run that towards the bottom, doing a circular stroke, trying to keep some of that movement showing, so I'm not blending it too, too much. Just really want it to feel like it's swelling. There's this visual crescendo that's happening that we're building to. A little finger painting incredibly useful tool when we are six and also when we are 30. 
Also, I'm sure I will do this <laughs> for the rest of my life. It's just a, just a good technique in general. Okay, now we can and will start taking out more of this free canvas. So Mars black, half that cerulean blue, a little bit of titanium white. What mix is that? The mix we used for the edges. We'll grab this. We use this brush. I'm going to come up to the top here in the middle. And then while the brush has rounded edges, if you work it more straight into the canvas, it is a very sharp edge. So we'll use that here to craft some very intentional line marks, line, <laughs> line work. markings and we'll just continue this fissure like application it can change I will have one drawn out in the traceable which you can get up over on patreon but it really is something that's incredibly malleable and if you find that it's just better if it's done a little bit differently on your canvas, I say go for it. These lessons are really meant to help you, to aid you, to give you a foundation, to give you confidence, let you relax and enjoy, but they're also not meant to handcuff you to a certain application, idea, rendering. If you want to take artistic liberties, you are more than welcome to. And this is one area where I think it'll be fairly dependent upon how everything is lit within your canvas. Now I am going to cover the entirety of this bottom area where the fire will be because it'll be a nice dark backdrop for the fire and it'll stand out significantly better because of it. That said, we do need it to blend into this bottom section. So we'll interject it, patches here and there, that way it feels like there's that connective tissue. Here I'll break it out into that area. Again, this is an area we can play with to a greater degree because we know that it's going to be covered up. But then once we have that practice, we can work it up here a little bit. You can see that I'm softening my edge now with the rounded portion of the brush. Starting by only doing so on the right hand side. You don't have to do it to all of the areas. You can see how it slowly expands to become something greater than what it initially was when it was drawn. I know you're far away. Camera. Uh, <laughs> I know that the camera is far away. And that's intentional because this is just one of those things where you want to look at it and think about it in the context of a distance because it's getting really easy to get up close and just worry about the details, but the details in this scenario really aren't what matters. It's the larger aesthetic and flow of it. Now I'm doing some blending on the left hand side. Something I neglected a little bit initially. Here we'll re-interject a bit of a darker portion into the light. Maybe we can bring it out. There we go.
Now, yet again, get a little bit closer. We're going to mix up some of that brighter blue. We have a hint of Mars Black still on the palette. A bit of the blue is diluted with Mars Black as well, so I'm not actually going to grab any, just because I want a very minimal amount. We want a little bit, but just not too, too much. And then we'll start re-interjecting some blue into these areas. Not too many. We can also start creating what will be definitive stars. So I'm just tapping these along. They're going to look a little out of place right now. That's okay. We're just establishing placements. And it'll allow us to put some throughout here as well. And see we're really jumping as well not focusing on one area. I'm still using the soft edge of the brush. I'm applying various amounts of pressure so that some of these are larger than others. But it's going to create a bit more of a cohesive tie between these brighter outskirts and what's occurring inside. See that? Starting to bring it together a little bit. A lot of this will be covered, but we can do a bit more down here as well. Realized I want some extra highlight out here, so not only building stars, but continuing to add to the greater brightness. That's something that's just consistently and progressively occurring throughout the process. Also, when we start to run out of paint, we can take the majority off throughout some of these brighter areas. We can also just take it off on a painting cloth. I'll do so now. We can go up and we can soften some of these hues with a very light application. Instead of hues, you're really softening the values here. Just making it a bit less stark. Giving it a more natural blend within its space, but not through all of it. I'm doing a lot of tap and drags. Focusing more on edges for the most part, but there will be scenarios where we just build in. Much better. It's all about the process. We take our time, we do our layers, it just gets better and better. Now, before we start doing any drastic changes, I am just one more time going to make a much brighter blue. And I'll reshape a couple of these portions Make this its own unique piece. Again, you don't have to. This is more just subjective personal preference. Build up these highlighted areas a bit more. That way it has a nice glow to it later on. Lots of blue. Yeah, 
And we just let this get darker. Now, next step is an interesting one. And for it, we're going to want to make sure that we have a drop cloth down or something that we're okay with getting paint on the floor. I'm not okay with getting paint on my floor. Uh, I do uh, lease the current unit I am, so we are going to keep it very clean and pristine. I'm going to put a cloth down, and then from there, we start applying just a grand selection of stars. So, our drop cloth is set up. I'm going to continue using the filbert initially, grabbing a lot of titanium white, a little bit of cerulean blue taking off the excess. We just want this to have a hint of blue. We don't want it to be a definitive blue. And then I'm going to go grab some water, and I'm going to work that into my mixture. Now you're probably familiar with the technique we're about to use, but just in case you aren't, we're essentially turning this into a watercolor of sorts, making it incredibly thin. So we can switch over to our liner brush. And this is incredibly small, incredibly sharp, great for detail work, but also applying a lot of this pigment. Now I'm going to grab that paint with this brush. I'm going to make sure it's nice and wet. Put my palette down. Hold my brush in front of my canvas, peel back the bristles, and just like that, stars, All right? I'm going to keep my palette down here while I do this, but every time I grab paint, it's just loading it up like that and applying like so. Now, we can be directional with our application by holding the brush close to the canvas and essentially the direction of the bristles will create the direction of the splatter. If we want it to be a bit more widespread, we take our brush, we hold it farther back and we do it this way. Now it's less noticeable, but it does add up over time. I'm going to get you a bit closer just so you can really see the amount we're adding with each application. So here we are, a little bit closer. Again, keeping my palette on the easel, getting very close, so directional. I'm trying to work the stars initially up the side like that. In between each application, I'm grabbing more water. There we go. And this is one of those things where we're going to want to do it a lot. Initially you think, oh, well, you know, I'll do it five, 10 times and I'll have a lot of stars. And you will, but you'll find typically the more you add, the better it'll look. Especially as we start to fill in this area with said stars. And this isn't the only way we're going to apply stars. We'll create some intentional ones afterwards but this is definitely the most effective way to get a lot of them on there and to do so with a randomized application so that again it doesn't look too intentional. Also, these markings are smaller than any tapped marking we could make. So they're quite valuable in that sense as well. I've been very close with a lot of these. I'll step back, that way we get some edge work, but not too much. And you can see how this would get messy. <laughs> I used to keep a laptop behind me with my reference photo. And that laptop is very speckled now. So you have been warned. It's really fun though. Great process. You want the majority of these to be in the center, in the light, really in the bright area is the most ideal spot. But we do need some towards the outskirts and I do want some at the bottom. So I'm actually going to create a horizontal application to fill in this area as well a little bit. 
Still dipping my brush in water in between each application. You can see how those horizontal strokes just worked so well through the bottom there. We can also take some of that pigment, just doing a little mixing here, and re-interject some intentional highlight throughout. these spots as we blend into the darker center. Using my pinky finger to ground my hand, eliminate shake. Something I find very useful as I sometimes forget to eat. <laughs> Just get really wrapped up in the painting process. And if that's you too, hey, make sure you have a snack or take a little break, get something to eat, maybe have a tea. Important we stay healthy. But you can see how just little details now do so much with all of those extra stars in here. Doing a lot of a tapping effect. That way it looks akin to the splattered stars that we've just applied. This is where it really starts coming together, eh? I just said A. Eh. Every time I do that, there's someone in the comments section who inevitably notes, you're Canadian, aren't you? And they're right, <laughs> I am. But that is uh, apparently the true giveaway. I always find it really interesting to hear where everybody else is from. What part of the world are you watching this from? Actually, I'd love to know in the comment section. Where are you from? What part of the world? What are some beautiful sights that you see or you've traveled to that you really want to paint. I always find that interesting, but also great for just general reference of, you know, what I should make paintings and lessons on in the future. You can see that I've also started to tap on individual stars, doing that in the previously established brighter clusters. trying to be fairly sporadic with it. Some of them are close together, some of them are farther apart. Sometimes I'm applying a lot of pressure to create a larger star because the bristles will expand when you add that pressure, but sometimes I'm applying very minimal amounts and I'm just trying to diversify that as much as possible. You can also connect areas through lines of stars, which I think can be a great look. We'll do that right here. I can get lost out in the darkness of space. Now, something else we're going to want to do is grab a little bit of our blue, mix that with the titanium white, make a not super bright mix, but not a dark one. Apply a little bit of paint. You can either use your finger to blend it out like that or if you don't have a lot of paint on your brush you can apply it and then you can do a little blend out. And that gives it that neat spiral look to it. And then once we have these muted brighter portions then we grab additional titanium white put that into our mix, and then we just tap it in the center. We can even do multiple. It can be a cluster of stars.
but that makes it look like they're glowing, right? Just gives it some added light. Going in with that really bright pigment towards the center as well. That's where we really want it. But we need enough of it that it isn't distracting. We also don't want too much of it that it doesn't stand out and it isn't special anymore. So it's all about finding that balance. And if you add too much, it's okay because you can always go back in with uh, more of the blue. Now we're going to take a break from our sky and head down to where our water will be. For that, we will grab our cerulean blue, a little bit of Mars black, good amount of titanium white, We'll start with a brighter mixture, at least in relation to the sky for the most part. And then with this, I'm going to draw a line, and I like to draw my lines through a series of strokes rather than a singular one, because when you do a singular one, oftentimes we end up with a larger curve, which I don't want for the horizon. Also, again, if you're just using the traceable, you will know that it's perfectly straight because I likely just used a grid line on Photoshop to draw that portion. <laughs> so you don't have to question it. Do a little softening towards the back. Start bringing it down. Remember that there is a camera behind my hand and I need to account for that. We're going to go all the way over the fire, the fire to be rather. Grab a bit more titanium white. As you move towards the sand, not too, too much, but a little bit. And we will have to go back to the water later because we're going to want to layer it over our sand to a point. But right now we're just putting in that first layer. The more layers you do, the better our paintings look typically. Especially with acrylics because they're such a such a thin medium. I can tell that this isn't straight. <laughs> if, I, if I sound a little distracted, I might get out a ruler. That might be the play. Right now though, I'm just building up that pigment. Slight gradient, brighter towards us, darker towards the back. Update, we broke out the ruler and I made a much darker mixture for the bottom here because I felt like this was conflicting too much with the brightness that we had up here. So just making those micro adjustments. Also, with this pigment, as I bring it forward, I'm not going for a perfect blend. I want small movements in the water. I want them to be somewhat inconsistent. There we are. Now we are done with the blue for this period. We'll probably go back and do a bit more later. We'll have to with the water, but for now, I just wanted to show you how I'm cleaning my palette. I've been getting that question a lot lately and I just use a drywall scraper. Though if you proceed to do what I am doing, I would heavily recommend you be very safe because I've definitely nicked myself on more than one occasion. And it's one of those things where you typically do have to apply some pressure because the paint has dried somewhat on the palette, but the sooner you get to it, the better it will look. So just, this is how I do it. Though 
I, I would recommend being very careful if you also attempt to do so this way. So everything has now dried to the touch and we're going to jump back in with the flat headed brush. I'm going to grab some burnt umber for the first time this lesson. We'll darken it with some Mars black and we'll desaturate it just a little bit with a hint of titanium white. Then we'll take this mixture, we'll head down to both of our corners, start a nice little vignette effect, bring it up towards the water, and for a little bit of a soft blend into said water, again we'll go back to the water, we'll paint it over top of this, but we do need to start with our base layers. We'll do so on the other side as well. Grab a bit of extra water from a brush. And be somewhat careful along here just because I do like how the water looks. Now as we start to get in towards the fire, we'll brighten it up. So I'll add extra burnt umber, extra titanium white, and we'll grab some cadmium red for the first time as well. Then a little bit of our cadmium yellow. These two will mix together, give us more of an orange hue, which will mix with the brown and give us a nice rich color for a sand. Now I'll use this to cut around some of the logs that we'll have for the fire. And then we'll start connecting them all, all of these markings towards the bottom. And after we've done all of that, then we can start blending it out into the edges. But we wanted to do essentially all of that center first. That way we weren't taking all of this darker pigment and dragging it in there, diluting it, and lessening our contrast. We'll have to do a couple of layers because as you can see, it's quite thin, but this will give us a strong start. Let's get you a bit closer though. So up close, we can really see the brush strokes and the fact that the canvas is showing underneath. That is just because the pigment is thin. Titanium white will really help thicken it, but again, it desaturates the pigment. So we resaturate it with our burnt umber and both of our cadmiums. This is much too orange though. So we'll re-interject that brown. We'll darken it a little bit with the Mars black that we still have on the side. I think that'll be a nice mix with what we currently have on the canvas. So much more thick. You can already see the difference. Nice and warm. Great contrast with the blue in the sky. As they are complementary colors and complementary colors do help each other pop. Once I have that, we blend out into the edges. Mine are still a little bit wet. It's starting to dry, but we're not, we're not fully there because the brush has been damp. It's kept the edges wet for a longer period of time. It's making this process a lot easier. If it was dry though, you just add a little bit of extra water to your brush and you do more of a wet into dry blend. I also don't hate the, one second, I also don't hate a little bit of that canvas tooth showing through, a little bit of texture, just because it is sand. It fit within the context of the setting. Going back in, adding that darker hue. A little bit down here as well. Make it more into a proper oval. Very soft brush strokes. I 
and we're just continuing to work it until we like the balance. Now, we'll take a very similar pigment to what we used on the edges with that same large flat-headed brush and we'll start crafting the logs which will work their way upwards into the soon-to-be fire. I like to work edges first, typically, as you can see, because when we have fresh paint on our brush, when we have the brush freshly dipped in water, we have the best opportunity to render sharp lines, so I like to begin there while we have that opportunity, and then when we start to run out, like now, I'll go and I'll just work in the body in the negative space. So, a little bit more water on the brush, more paint. We can go back to working edges. You can see that I'm rotating my brush quite a lot. I have a collection of them here. And I can tell that I'm already running out of paint. So I'll just do some blocking. Also, friendly reminder, if you are new to the channel, this is your first time here, don't forget to subscribe because I do painting lessons like this quite frequently. Aiming for weekly, but if not weekly, definitely bi-weekly. Have some of them really protruding. We'll have the fire cover those areas, or we can go back and add sand. Want to make sure that we have some nice thick applications. So I'm going over areas twice, if not three times. giving the edges of some of these very unique looks. Some of these are much smaller than others. That's important too. Okay, so the canvas is now fully dry to the touch. I'm going to go back in with the filbert. And for this, we're going to use some cerulean blue Titanium white, grabbing from a clean spot here. We have a lot of it that's diluted. Don't want that right now. And we'll grab a hint of Mars Black, taking off the excess. From there, we'll go in with just a little bit of paint. We don't want too, too much. Essentially going to create a line, a couple millimeters down. We can do this on both sides. And then I'll blend upwards with the remainder of the pigment when I don't have too, too much. And you can see how we have a semi-transparent marking there and it looks like the water fades back. We'll do it again. Again, don't have too much paint left on my brush. I'm not using much pressure. And we have that fade back. Going to grab some extra water, grab that pigment, we'll do one more of these little layers. We don't want to bring it too forward because we don't want it conflicting with where the fire is. And here you can see there are slight inconsistencies. like that a lot, it just makes it look more natural rather than having it perfectly straight. So there's a bit of an opening, opening, and I'm not even going to complete that area. I'm also not going to do the fade back through all of it, just little portions here and there. So you see my brush strokes are extremely loose. 
Now, make sure that brush is nice and damp. Just clean it, put her down, pick up the liner, make that nice and damp, grab additional titanium white, work that into our previous mix, grab more water so that we have a nice, very condensed bristle, take our hand to ground it on the canvas or the easel, sharpen that edge. Make it a little bit brighter. Again, being somewhat inconsistent with it, intentionally so. Making lots of little strokes rather than a singular large one. We can also do lots of little taps towards the real foreground rather than uh, rather than an entire line because we'll really see that detail of the water coming in texturally it'll be a really nice cohesive piece with the stars right we have the blue we have the small taps It's a tiny detail, but it does build nicely. And we'll just do a bit more over here again. Really stands out when it's just against the sand. Just connecting a couple of them, but leaving others not so much. And I like to connect the ones that are a bit closer to the fire. That way we get that vignette towards the edge. There's less light towards each side, and there's also less of a fixed, constrained marking, right? We move more into pattern than we do a stroke, and I think that looks better on the edges because it's less of a demanding visual. That said, like how that looks, it's time to start working on the fire. So I think this is a part a lot of us get really excited about. Before we jump in, make sure that your water here is entirely dry. And we're also going to make sure that our brush as well as our actual water are nice and clean because we don't want the blues that we just worked with working into our yellows and making a green. We want to keep it much more of an orange. So we'll grab our cadmium red, about double that in our cadmium yellow. That'll give us a mid-orange. Make it a bit thicker with titanium white. Re-interject some red. We want our base layer to be a bit more red and we want it to be somewhat thick but somewhat transparent, <laughs> which I know sounds a, a little bit of a contradiction. We want it to be both, right? We don't want it to skew to either direction too, too hard. And with this, I'm going to essentially sketch in the base of our fire and we'll build on this through a lot of layers. This is essentially just the beginning, where we want these flames to move in general. I'm using the filbert brush because I want to be able to deliver sharp markings for portions. I want to be able to work in large amounts like the body here. But on top of all of that, I want to be able to blend edges, which the side of the brush is doing great for me here. So I'm just working through my drawing. I redrew it on with Conte which is a great medium because you just add a little bit of water and it comes right off. 
also lets you allocate color, so my drawing's in an orange. But again, if you'd like help with the drawing process, I will have the traceable up over on Patreon. You can use a mini projector or tracing paper. There's also a gridded version, so if you're like me and you like to look at a gridded drawing and then sketch it on, so you work on your drawing, your sketching skills while getting the image right, there's also that gridded version. And it'll also be done, the traceable, to the final painting. So you don't have to worry about making adjustments as you go. It'll be right from the start. Just going to thicken the middle, let it dissipate as we get towards the edges. Don't worry, we will go over this with a much brighter pigment with our yellows and have some titanium white in there. We'll have it get lost behind some of these logs, but we also have it going in front of them as well. This is semi-transparent, so we'll see portions of the log showing through the fire, which I really like. And then when we get down towards the logs, I like to work with my brush so that it gets a bit more of a sharper marking and it looks like the flame is touching, connecting to the wood and working its way upwards. See that? See how it catches? And then moves up. Shouldn't look great yet, so don't worry. If it doesn't, if it looks a little messy, it's meant to. It's just part of the process. Now, once that's dry, or at least fairly dry, we're going to make sure that our brush is nice and damp, and we'll make a more yellow and white variant than our last one. Now, we don't want it to be a true yellow yet. We're just working our way towards an orange, but it's a more yellow orange, right? So we're taking baby steps. I think that's really pretty. Definitely a step in the right direction. We're going to start by applying it into the center. We can work it down these lines that again connect to the logs. And I like to place it typically on top of the strokes that I'm making. So imagine that there's a light source on top. Imagine that it's a hard object. The light's coming down. It's reflecting on it and then it's working way down and it's dissipating in the process. So I like to apply it to the top. And then we start moving it out. And as I move it out, I move it typically in the middle of the body of the flame. So towards the bottom here where it's connecting to the logs, it's on the top of the flame. Here, it's in the middle. And we have a progression from one to the other. Doing this through a lot of little strokes, leaving quite a bit of that semi-opaque, more red hue mixture on the edge but then also tapping some of this coming out there. Working our way up. Leaving openings. Looks so red because we have the blue right behind it. But don't worry. We will keep adding layers until we have the truly desired hues. Really just working its way up there, see? And I continue to embellish as we proceed, working out edges, areas that might crackle and 
flash out. Now we can wait for it to dry if we want the next layer to be very prominent or if we want a bit more of a subtle look we can just proceed while it's still a little bit wet. Here yet again working extra yellow into the mix. Towards the bottom what do we do? We apply it to the top of the area that stretches down onto the wood. There we go. Then we move more into the heart of each flame. Softly blending our edges out into the orange, which blends out into the red. Leaving those openings. Getting there. Still looking fairly messy, but getting there. What we're trying to do is build up these layers without making the edges too opaque. Just getting that in the middle. And towards the bottom, we have a lot more of these hues condensing connecting. It can also be the most opaque in the real center here. Don't be afraid to eliminate detail to consolidate those hues, values, applications. Okay, yet again what do we do? Titanium white, cadmium yellow, into that mix. Now we're definitely going to be painting on wet pigment, so this isn't going to be what we have on the palette. It'll be a mix of what's on the palette, what's on the canvas. But more layers isn't a bad thing, it just gives us more opportunities to make minor adjustments which build to painting that and have a lot more thought into it, right? The more layers you have, the more opportunity and time you have to make those micro decisions which impact the painting. A lot of those micro decisions impact the painting greatly. going to skip a little bit of this area and then let it flare out again towards the top. See how it's kind of reaching up into the sky? I like that look a lot. And again, we go back down, we consolidate. Still quite a ways to go. Titanium white. Cadmium yellow. Oh, that's pretty. This one's making an, an impact. Now when we start to get to pigment this bright, we want to really initially keep it to the center. It can overwhelm the piece quickly. We'll use it sparingly.
good. Now we're at a point where we need more detail work. So we'll switch to the liner. More titanium white. A little bit of that yellow. Starting in the center, not at the bottom this time. And you can see how these sharper markings making a big impact already. It's giving us some form again. And I start some tapping where again it might be sparking, working its way out. Be careful with this, we don't want too, too much. I think I did slightly more than I wanted to right there. So I just find the areas that are pointing outwards and then I continue that idea through these taps. You can see this splits off in a couple of different ways. Starting to get a little bit more lively. Use those dots to connect this piece right back to the center. The taps will be fairly visually harmonious with what we did right down here and the stars themselves. It's just in a different hue. Slowly just building. Adding in new movements. You can see that it almost starts to become like the stars. Still quite a bit to do, but it's starting to look quite nice. This top area is the arguably most important. It's where the eye is going to follow. So I'm doing this after I start the general practices down there so that I have my practice with the techniques. And you can see we're working in that darker middle fissure area. That way it pops to a greater degree. Now as we come down, we can really embellish. Make so many of these much more unique than they were. So much of this is done through tapping. Hold the brush a little bit farther down so you can see better. Again, having it kind of crackle out different areas. 
I know I'm a bit more quiet through this part of the process, but it's just one of those things where it's a lot of constantly questioning your marking and ensuring that you're progressing it properly. So, kind of deep in thought, it's always just minor problem solving. Right now I'm debating if that negative space is something that should continue to exist. I think it should, so I'll leave it for now. And I'll embellish other areas. Doing this because I saw the orange, and a lot of our highlights are fairly dim. Because the paint was thin, and very watery, which is a good thing. Let us choose to heighten it rather than forcing us to. Doing some little taps within these to bring some greater detail to the center. So we, it looks like we have these sparks in the middle as well. That's important. They don't just go to the left and right hand side. These crackling effects do happen all the way throughout. So we'll do some towards the bottom. We can also take this pigment, maybe with a little bit more red, but not much. And work it down into the logs. Incorporating more tapping this time, as you can see. getting these nice blends. Now you've seen the details up close and how we were going about that so now I'm going to show you how we expand the fire but I'm going to do so from a distance because we really want to be able to look at it as a whole rather than get stuck in the details. So I'm going to start with a bit more of a brighter reddish orange like you can see right here. Make my brush nice and damp because something I want is a larger fire. So I'll start prepping the expansion. To work its way out through here. And I think that there could be more of a, a curve that goes this way. So expand on that. Now it should be quite a bit wider. And making it wider, we probably want to make it slightly taller. So for that, we'll just continue working this up for now. And you can see that it continues to follow that fissure. It's a really neat look, it's different. And we can take some of that highlight, work it in the middle of those newly prepped areas. Had 30, 40 seconds to dry. So it's not fully dry, but it's drier. It's dry enough to apply this without it becoming significantly darker. We get a nice blend, but we don't get the trouble of it just not showing up. Really expanding. Shows up nicely towards the darker areas of the water down here. We really went out of our way on the left hand side to embellish around the water, so we'll do that here too. And these sparks will look really nice against that deep blue. Now 
We can expand here now too. So you see how it just continues to get a little bit bigger? Trying to keep my head fairly far back. And I'm doing quite a bit of the paint actually not looking at the painting, but I'm looking in the viewfinder because the viewfinder makes it look, you know, 10 feet away, which you can do with a mirror or your smartphone or your camera. I think that we're almost at the point where we've expanded it enough and we need to get closer to reinstigate detail within our newly established spaces. So let's, let's get you a little bit closer. We can continue to really build on the depth of the fire by taking some extra titanium white, moving it to a clean spot, grabbing the smallest hint of our yellow, the smallest hint of our red, but more so yellow. Work that in. Head to the center. Build that. You can see that it's not a dramatic difference, but there is a difference. And that's what painting this is really about. Just the most minor continuous changes for progression. Yet again, even brighter. Though these are hues that we, for the most part, will want to keep fairly centralized so that it doesn't become visually too much. You can do little taps in here as well. Saw that one of the, uh, the last clips where we were close up was about 15 minutes, which means this painting is starting to get to a good length, a healthy length. But I would like to say a big thank you to all of you for sticking around, working with me through the painting process. Always love when people are passionate about art, painting, making these. Appreciate that the the talks and the lessons are getting heard, you know? So big thank you to you for being a part of the community. Working on this, I hope that if you've started, your rendition is going lovely. You're very happy with it. And if you haven't started yet, I hope that you are getting very inspired. That you're picking up a lot of ideas. I'd also, of course, like to say a big thank you to everybody up over on Patreon for supporting the channel directly, making these longer lessons happen. Talk about it all the time, but really couldn't be doing this without you and your support. This channel is predominantly community funded. Do that up on Patreon and all of you support up there, you make this happen. It's the reason we don't have 80 ads <laughs> in the three hour long videos. We just have them at the very start and the, the very end for these long ones. And that's because of the real generosity of the community. So big thank you to you. I don't know if you've noticed, but everybody at the great wide open tier's name is also now at the end of the video in the thank you for producing the show section. Really do appreciate it. And I know, I, I know I say it in every episode, and I, I'm sure to some of you who watch all of these it might get a little annoying, but I think it's important to uh, share that gratitude. Also, if you are new here, again, 
up over on Patreon, you can get the traceable, so the, the digital sketch, the drawing. You can find the reference photos that I use. This one was really a collection of photos. Um, also upload pictures of all of the paint tubes and materials so you can see all of the brands that I work with. Not sponsored by them, but just my, my preferences. That way you can make sure you're working with the exact same pigments and whatnot. We also have an exclusive Facebook group where everybody shares their renditions of these paintings, which is really neat because people take them in different directions and you, you can get inspired, ask questions. It's a really supportive community, which I adore. I was just scrolling through some of the paintings that were posted today and I was amazed and I was inspired and I was very proud. So you can get access to that. You can also get all of my ebooks up there as well, including acrylics for beginners, which is essentially the essentials, everything you need to know about acrylic paintings before you jump into your first acrylic painting. As well as a bunch of ebooks full of traceables for the days where you you want to paint something, but you're not sure what you want to paint. You can just start with one of those drawings. We also have a bunch of bonus lessons, some of which are on really big 24 by 36 inch canvases and they're broken up into parts so they're essentially 10 plus hour lessons but they're uh they're broken up so they're digestible it's like one to two hours each session so there's a bunch of fun stuff up there if you're interested but if you're not it's also okay just glad you're here working on this with me you can see how long I've been painting these little highlights really is one of those things where you can just go on and on with it. Making minor little tweaks, chasing that perfect look. I really enjoy it. It's one of those things where I could put on music and just paint for hours. Lose track of time. This is getting nice. Visually, it's starting to blend into the stars in a really neat way. Starting to find that magic in the piece. We just keep crafting it until it appears. All right? We move out through pattern, and then we can get sporadic. And we build. Still have a lot to do down here, but I just want to establish the majority of the fire first. Now, we'll briefly take a step back and we'll grab some of our titanium white, a little bit of our cadmiums, Mix up a fairly bright orange, but we do want it to be an orange. We don't want it to be a warm white. Don't mix up too, too much. Then we'll grab water, mix it nice and thin like a watercolor. And as you remember how we applied stars, we're going to add some sparks To our fire. Not too, too many, but you can see how they work their way up into the stars now. And we just have this really beautiful amalgamation of pattern through different hues. I'm working fairly directionally with these, just like that. 
And you can work with different colors. I don't want to overdo it. So this will probably be my last application in this way. And then we'll get nice and close for the logs. Now we'll head down in our canvas and start working on the flames that will really show through the wood. Now we'll begin with a darker orange, one that's a bit more red. So probably use an even mixture of the cad red and yellow. Grab a hint of titanium white. We do want to thicken it. And then we do need to darken it. So the smallest amount of Mars black. Just like so. Make our brush nice and clean. And with this, we can definitely work down from the fire. And I'll do this in elongated strokes, which catch each other and move in the direction of the log. Because we're essentially painting the top of the bark. Areas that have little bits of that flame and heat, but we're not just going to place it on the top there. And now that we know that we like our pigment, I will mix more of it. Just like so. Just going back through all of our pigments repeatedly till we build up a real abundance of a color that we know we like a lot. So, yet again taking the extra pigment off my brush so I don't accidentally make too large of a marking. And with this, we're also going to start placing that heat underneath because realistically a lot of this heat is coming from inside and towards the bottom. So I start it up towards the top of where our log is and then I work it down and I have it dissipate as you move in that direction. Now this log is in front of this one so it's going to start right here and you can see that we are working predominantly in markings that move in the general direction of the log itself but I also do ones that cross on this axis as well We'll go over them a couple times towards the top to build up that hue and let it dissipate as we get towards the bottom. And we'll continue migrating to other logs. Grab some extra water. We'll do some on the right hand side of this. This is an interesting one. It'll have essentially these markings on the top and bottom because it's so close to the flame itself. So you can see that it wraps around the edges but it still dissipates as we move down. Here's another one where we'll see it a lot on the side. And it can be less stark in the ones that are a little bit farther away with the ones in the true foreground catching more attention. Here I have quite a bit of water on my brush, which is nice in that it's going to make these semi-transparent, so it's something we can build on, experiment with, but it is making my stroke a little bit larger than I want. So take off a bit of the excess. Go back, grab more pigment. Also, while I'm making elongated markings, it is good to break them up. So now you can see there's a start and stop to it. That's just going to make it look a little bit more natural, more unique. Okay, now let's make a bit of a brighter mix. So, our yellow, a little bit of titanium white. 
and we can work some flames in between our logs have them wrap their way up this will just be our base layer but I'll add some extra context to our subjects and this will further pronounce the idea that there needs to be that light underneath right Really like that. I'll go over and build up the centers to make them a bit more opaque, leave the edges to be semi-transparent to a point. But I'm also not going into the same brightness that I have here because I do want it to dissipate. You can also have like the bottom of the log on fire a little bit. It's a good look. With this, when we have almost no paint, we can also work it down into the sand. Maybe do a little finger painting. Just let that heat emit. Now some of these logs will cast shadows, we do need to think about that, but we can also go back and add those later if we want. Now we essentially have a nice glow coming out. from the fire. That said, let's take a bit of this and use it to expand on some of those sharper markings for the bark. Because now we can build on top of a slightly brighter pigment where the previous one was closer to a black. Therefore, those initial applications weren't as bright as they were on our palette. So, through additional layers, we can build it up and just make it look a whole lot more clear and sharp, balanced with the rest of the piece. like that a lot. And you can see that we just spend a little bit of time here, a little bit of time there, and it all starts to come together. Now I'm going to take a bit of a step back, so we're farther away. I'm switching to the Filbert brush, again the one with the nice round corners, and with this I'm going to take that really nice warm orange that we have, add a lot of water to it, to the point where it's essentially like a watercolor, similar to what we did when we did the splattering effect, but this time I'm going to do something different, and I want you to watch what I'm doing before you proceed to try it at home. But I'm essentially doing a glaze of warmth around the edge of the fire. And I'm doing this because I felt like the brighter middle portion extended out to a really large degree to the point where it wasn't unique and it no longer had that popping that warmth in the center that I wanted. So by making the edges a bit warmer, 
and a bit darker because this hue is a bit darker. It doesn't have as much titanium white in it. We're essentially able to bring the attention back towards the center where I wanted it. Now it's something that can be rebuilt up. We can make it brighter again. And as you can see towards the edges, because we're also getting portions of the sky, we're getting a slight green, but if you keep your mix much more towards the red side, it won't look bad. But it is something to be careful of, something to be mindful of. You can really tell just how much more that pops now though. And that was really our goal here. You can see, we can make it dramatically more orange should we want to. And I think that the orange actually looks really nice with all of the blue. So I'm a big fan. We can also take this, bring it down towards the base, and brighten that a little bit. Said I need more paint. Here we're mixing up a lot of paint. Don't need to do that, admittedly. A bit of an accident. That's okay. We'll grab some titanium white, hint of Mars black, and then we'll make it very watery yet again. Love this brush because again, I can kind of sharply cut around a lot of these pieces of wood, but then I can also blend with a corner of the brush. It's very versatile. Now we're blending it out. Aiming for a soft transition. Get darker towards the edges. Get darker towards the back. It's not making a really grand visual change, but enough of one. And the more we spread it out, the more subtle it gets. Now, as we really step back, we get to see a lot of it starting to come together. I'm going to take some Mars Black, quite a lot actually, a little bit of our Titanium White, Burnt Umber, some Cadmium Red, smallest hint of the yellow, and I'll also start implementing some smaller little rocks, pebbles, throughout the sand. And this is yet another detail that's in the same way the stars and the sparks, it's a pattern. It's a small tapped in effect. It's detail. It's randomized. And it makes it feel a bit more alive. I think one thing I really didn't want this to turn into was kind of a empty painting, right? We had this neat concept, but I think if we just continuously double down on that, we would lose the opportunity to create some other really nice features. And as you can see, this is a very quick addition you're quite far away because this is just one of those portions that you kind of want to see it as a whole. You don't want to get too stuck in the details. You want to make sure that we're constantly looking at both sides and balancing it appropriately. So we're just kind of working them throughout. We're also going to take some of it and do some tapped on markings. I like these a lot. Trying to randomize them to the best of my ability. 
There we go. You can add some out in the water if you'd like. I want to keep mine a bit smaller than that though. Now, we'll take that highlight that we have with the orange. Make sure that it has a good amount of pigment there. Then we'll mix up a bit of a darker but red heavy orange. Make sure that our brush is fairly clean. And then we'll add some highlights to the rocks, stones, and pebbles that are closest to our fire. We don't want to go with a pigment that's too bright for this because we want it to be subtle. We also are always thinking about which direction the rock faces in relation to the light because on the left hand side, the right hand side of the rocks is highlighted because that's what's facing the light and it's opposite over here. So it's fairly intuitive. That's how I'm just jumping from rock to rock, pebble to pebble. I really enjoy this part of the process. It's very relaxing. Also getting the little ones, they matter too. Then, for the ones that are closer to the fire, we'll grab some extra yellow, a little bit of extra white. Again, we're not going for a truly bright pigment, but we are going for something a little bit brighter and a little bit more yellow. And then we can apply that right on top of the orange we just worked in. This will give us some additional depth. The hue will be more unique. We're only doing it to a select few, not even half, but the ones that are closest are going to catch that light. You also don't have to do it to all of the closer ones. You can pick your favorites, but I like that a lot. I'm now going to take some of that orange and just be a little playful with what we have up here. I really like it, but I think we can do some slight additions. So we have some extra sparks flying. All of the orange working its way up through here into the real blues. So I think a pretty beautiful thing really just gets lost as it works its way up to the top. Maybe darken some of the tips without making them too opaque. Then work on some additional hand-drawn sparks. We did a lot where we just kind of <laughs> flung them at the canvas, but we can also incorporate some additional, more controlled applications. Just like that. I think it just gets better and better. We can also add extra markings into our wood at the bottom. Just make it a bit more textured and dimensional. That said, we are coming towards the end. And I do like to give a little keyword, something you can use in the comments. You can either incorporate it into a sentence or you can just leave the word itself. But typically, at the end of these, about 13% of people are still watching. So it's a little badge of honor to note that 
you are one of those 13% who is truly dedicated to learning what we did here today. And today, I think our word will be cohesive. Because that was something we were really were and still are really working on balancing. You know what? It can be the word cohesive or balanced. Viewer's choice. But either of which, I will know that you made it here and everybody else who made it here will also know that you did too. I always say this, but it really is fun to see the people who continuously get them at the end of these lessons. But today we're going with cohesive and balanced or either or because that was really the goal here. We were trying to balance all of the stars with the sparks with all of the other little tapped details. We're trying to make it all cohesive. I feel like those two words just sum up the larger goals in this one. Also, as we do near the end, I would like to say yet again a big thank you to you for sticking around, being a part of this. I hope that you are you're picking up some ideas, you're finding yourself inspired, if you're painting along that it's going lovely. I already have some other great ideas for paintings I want to do this January, so if you haven't already, make sure that you do subscribe. And again, big thank you to everybody who supports the channel directly up over on Patreon. There will be a link to that in the description. And it's a great place to get the ebooks, the traceables, access to the Facebook group, art reviews, bonus lessons, all of that good stuff. And again, if you'd like these brushes, they are also listed in the video description. They are entirely vegan and cruelty free, which is something that I very much am proud of. Don't have to worry about the glues that bind them or the bristles. You know that it's an ethical set. It's so hard to put the brush down. <laughs> I feel like I could just top and do these talk and do these taps forever. And part of it is that I feel like it does just get better. There will be a point where it's too much and that's okay. I get asked the question all the time, you know, how do you know when your painting's finished? And for me, it's always the idea of, well, I like to add and add and add and add and eventually I feel like it is too much. And then I know that it's taken farther than it should be. So then I paint over little bits, I just walk it back until I find that perfect middle ground because I've seen it when it's too little and I've seen it when it's too much. So I know that I'm right there. And then it's just minor tweaks. It means a little bit more work, but you never have to wonder or worry. You know, what if I did this? What if I did that? What if I added more here? You check all of those boxes. You get great practice in. And that's how I personally like to do it. But because of that, you also get elongated videos where I just talk and add these taps to the canvas and really enjoy the process. Hope that you are too. Hope that you find these relaxing. Hope you find these a little inspiring. I know I watch a lot of painting videos now when I want to feel a little artistically inspired as well. Ooh, I like that a lot. Maybe we'll just add a little bit of extra brightness to some of the flames down here.
I think those work really well. Yeah. And we can just build some extra volume by not making this extremely bright, but just adding a little bit more into the body. That said, I think that's our lesson. Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending this time with me. I will see you very soon with a brand new painting. Again, I already started working on a couple of ideas and I look forward to sharing those with you too. So you have a lovely day and I'll see you soon. Hey there, uh, me again. Welcome to a little bonus segment, I suppose. It's one of those situations where you finish your painting and then you leave it up and then you look at it throughout the day, throughout the week, and you say, you know what, I could go back and I could, I could add this or I could add that. So there are a couple of things I wanted to show you that I ended up doing. First of all, there are a lot of little details in here. The first one is I'm just taking a little bit of Mars black, hint of titanium white, burnt umber, hint of cad red, making a fairly dark mixture not as dark as the wood but close and then I just go in and I do this little tap a lot of it even connects to the wood itself but it's predominantly towards the center here and then it dissipates to a point as we move outwards just because I don't want too much detail throughout the entirety of the sand I want it to be a bit more centralized to keep our eye here but it is a nice additional detail and it balances the darts in the wood out in the sand, which I think is really nice. So even now you can see that I'm continuously adding quite a bit of it. It's something that can be added in abundance. Also, with all of the highlights, I wanted a bit more of those to uh, continue that theme of balance. So I make a somewhat brighter yellowish orange it still has a bit of that burnt umber that red and i essentially do what i did with the darker mixture same thing i just go out and i do these taps they'll show up a bit better towards the edge but i don't want too many of them though the combination of the two details really does add a lot to this area then one final thing take my Mars black titanium white a little bit of burnt umber a little bit of a red yellow more red than yellow make it nice and transparent I'll go behind my rocks in the direction of the fire and then I'll blend down a little bit of a shadow for them. So I'm just going right under, right behind and that shadow will change. So here fires that way. So you essentially go to the middle of the fire, you work your brush out and that's where you do your shadow. See that? Nice and easy? Nice and easy. And you can make them shorter or longer. Depends on how dramatic you want it. I'm only really doing this to the larger ones. For the most part. We can get little shadows for the smaller ones too. So, this is also just an example of you know, we think we're done our painting. Then inspiration strikes later, it's okay to go back to it. It's okay to add. Don't ever worry about ruining your painting, even if you love it, because you can build on it, you can make it better. And if it doesn't make it better, that's okay too, because we can always work it back. All of that painting is great practice. The lessons we learn is important. There we are. Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, little extra segment, but again, thank you for being here. 
and you have a lovely evening.